Australia and I didn't want to go. I hated the idea. I just wanted to become a hairdresser and live in the suburbs and smoke a lot of weed and just hang out. But that didn't happen so I decided my parents shipped me overseas and my dad forced me to go to school. And on, I wagged the first two days of my school and on the third day I went to school and I walked into the school, this big scary building with graffiti all over it. And I was like, right, where is everyone? No one was there. No one. So I was walking around and I was trying to find someone to tell me what was going on. Is there no school? It's a Wednesday. Don't know what's going on. So I walked up the stairs and there is my soon-to-be literature teacher sitting there reading a book. And I was like, excuse me, sir, is there school today? And he's like, yes, there is. And I was like, well, where is everyone? And he was like, they've gone to a protest in the city. You should go. Uh, America wants to build 12 bases, army bases on the islands. And they decided that it's school assembly that they didn't want to do it. You should go. So... I had two choices. I could have just gone home, <laughs> smoked cigarettes and drink coffee and enjoy the weather, or I could have gone down to the protest. So I decided to go down to this protest. And I went down, and it was amazing. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. There were people dancing and drinking and laughing and joining hands and being all like excited. And they marched all the way up to the American Embassy. And I went to my first protest and had a positive outcome, because instead of the 12 faces, they only built the two. So yes, in the following years I finished my studies and decided to go to university and when I was in university I spent most of my time in Exarchia. Now for all of you who know what Exarchia, what, if you don't know what Exarchia is, it is a, what we call in Greece the rebel's lair. It is a suburb in Greece dedicated to activists, anarchists and mainly artists and musicians. I spent the next three years in Exarchia learning everything I could possibly learn, from philosophy to politics to everything you could possibly, you know, imagine. Sorry, guys. Um, also, the university, they're very sacred places. A lot of universities, uh, the Politecnia, which is one of the most sacred places for me on this planet, um, actually has hosts, wanted anarchists in their underbunks because it is illegal to arrest any anarchist in a place of sacred knowledge. And this is because there was a civil uprising in 1973 where two army tanks drove into the university and squashed 200 people. After that, it was illegal, completely illegal, to arrest anyone in a university. Oh. So Greece has a long history of civil uprising. They got rid of the Turks, then they got rid of Mussolini in the 40s, and they had a Khudda, then they had an army coup, and then they had the civil uprising, the student uprising in 1973, now they have a huge crisis, so they haven't really had a break. So my last year in Greece was a tough one. I was working three jobs and I couldn't make ends meet and I was wondering why. I was like, why can't I make ends meet? My pay got reduced and my hours got increased and I found myself pretty much, you know, trying to scatter around to make ends meet. Um, it was really hard and by the end of that, that summer, my grandmother died and that was my kind of ticket out of there. I came back to Australia. Um, you could say subconsciously, I had a return ticket to go back and I didn't go. Um, because during that, that one year before my grandmother died, there was talk of corruption. There was talk of politicians stealing, like getting loans from the EU and buying um, villas and sending their children off to America. There was talk of all these lies coming up to the surface and it was just basic talk like I'm talking to you guys now. It wasn't on a mass level. People kind of knew what was going on but really didn't know what was truly going on. So the last year there was a lot of talk about it. So when I was going to like go to the airport to leave, I turned around and said to my mum, I can't go. I'm going to stay. 
because I knew, I knew that something was going to happen. So I decided to come back to Australia and I decided that I'm done with politics, that's it. I'm done, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm hungry, I'm, I'm just, I just can't deal with it anymore. And I'm going to spend the next, I want to reclaim my youth and I'm going to spend the next three years of my life just doing, you know, the same old Melbourne sex, drugs and rock and roll and I'm just going to have a good time. Um, that only lasted for about two years because two years ago, as most of you know here, um, Occupy Melbourne happened and I walked down into the city and for me it was one of the most magical experiences in my entire life. It sparked that, that passion in me that I had when I was living in Exarchia. It sparked this, this light for me and it was six days of pure magic and I met some of the most incredible people ever, ever other than that. Thank you for being alive, everyone. Um, so after that, I decided, right, I'm done. I'm going to dedicate my life to change, and here I am. I'm going to dedicate my life and reenact change and go and talk and share and learn as much as I possibly can about what is happening today in the world. I finally then... so I'm just going to drink some water. Not too much. <laughs> so, where am I up to all my notes? I just kind of remember it off my heart. Okay, so... I decided to go back to Greece this year because my friends were telling me all these stories and I wanted to go see it for myself. I delayed going for many years because I was, I didn't want to see what was going on. I just wanted to hear it and I was fine with that because I have it kind of good here, you know? And I felt, I felt the guilt of that and I felt the guilt all the way on the plane ride until I got to Greece. And I get to Greece and my dad picks me up and I'm really excited. I'm like, I'm going to see my friends, I'm going to see what's happening, I'm going to see the place that I love and I grew up in. And we get off the freeway, or the airport freeway, and everything's okay until this point. And we get onto the city link. And we're driving in the car and I'm just sitting there and I'm just like, oh, something's not right. And I look up and I look at the billboards and I was like, oh, there's no advertising. <laughs> Who can afford advertising? on it when there's a financial crisis, right? And that's the first thing that I like really noticed. And instead of advertising, there are political slogans all the way down the freeway. And I couldn't help but smile and say to myself, ah, I'm home, in, like, in a kind of sense. Now, I'm just going to give you guys a, a visual of what a city looks like when there is a financial crisis, okay? So just bear with me if I get a little bit emotional on this part. So, basically, what a, a city looks like in a financial crisis. There is stray animals everywhere because no one can afford to feed their pets anymore. So, there was already a certain amount of stray dogs in Greece, but now it has tripled, okay? Um, parks are empty and have dried up. There is rubbish everywhere because rubbish people go on strike when there's a crisis because they're not getting paid enough to pick up that rubbish. So, there are piles and piles of massive rubbish just sitting in the centre of just a neighbourhood, you know, and it's... Yeah, it's really, really stings. It's not the best thing. Um, there are, uh, there's unfinished construction everywhere. Um, there are homeless people everywhere. The amount of beggars I saw when I was in Athens last was horrifying. There, were, there was always some form of, like, there was gypsies and stuff that used to beg, but now it's like, it's just everyone's, like, in this whole circle of just, you know, asking for money and, like, it, it was really, it wasn't the place that I, that I remembered it to have been. Completely different place. Um... There is a sadness sometimes in the city that you can't cut with a sledgehammer and you can really feel it. Now I'm not saying that it's that it's a it's a dark place. I want to, you know, Athens for me is a place that, that I love and, I, and for me to say something like that is very, very, very hard. But but there is and I can feel it because I, I felt I felt the energy there and, and it was sad. Not not hope there, there's hope, but it was it was sad. Um, now I started getting anxiety while I was in Greece, heavily, and one night I decided that I need to go to a hospital because I was having really, really bad anxiety from what I was experiencing. So I was like, to my boyfriend at the time, I was like, please take me to a hospital, and if you're going to take me to a hospital, take me to the one in Vula, because it's a rich area, and it's a huge hospital, and I'll be able to get care there, and I won't have to wait because it's in a very, very rich area, so it'll be a great hospital. So I get to Vula and I walk up the steps to the hospital and there are three nurses sitting outside and I was like, I need to see a doctor. And they're like, there are no doctors. And I was like, um, what do you mean there are no doctors? She's like, there are no doctors. Um, you have to get into a taxi and drive an hour to the other side of town if you want to see a doctor. She's like, you look fine, you look fine, I think you're going to be okay. 
my death anxiety went straight, like it shot straight through the roof. I was like, oh my God, if anything happens to me in this country, I'm gone, I'm gone. If there's no doctors, does that mean there are no ambulance people coming to pick me up? Does that mean that, you know, if anything does happen to me, what is going to happen to me? And last but not least, let's talk about my favorite people, the police in Athens. So when I was growing up in Greece, police were guys that used to sit at a cafe and they used to <coughs> play cards with old people. The only time I ever got pulled over in Greece by a police guy was when he wanted my number, pretty much, basically. <laughs> so um, going to Greece and seeing a big presence of police really, really shocked me. They have now um, employed the, the triple amount, I think, of policemen working in the city and they're on every corner on these motorbikes and they drive around continuously interrogating and intimidating everyone. I mean, if you walk down the city, even as a tourist, I would have been like, what's going on when you're constantly being circled by these two guys on bikes? And, yes, and the police violence has gone beyond anything anyone could ever, ever imagine. Um, that's why they also hire one of the biggest, like, corporate police when there's protests, and they hire them from Troika, and then these big, big big ass motherfuckers, <laughs> sorry, that, that they hire to, you know, come down to these protests to kind of like, you know, not let them storm parliament and do all that kind of stuff. But pretty much a friend of mine once said to me that when she was in a riot recently that she was hoping that the batons that she was getting hit by the police would kill her because it would be worse to end up in police station afterwards than it would have been to have died on the street that day. So basically another friend of mine told me that what they do to them in the police station pretty much they do everything except rape them pretty much and there are horrific stories and I know it's, it's hard and, it, and it's but I have to say it because I'm not going to sit here and, and give you the fairy tale story of what is going on. This is going on. This is the truth. This is what is actually going on. And just when you thought it couldn't get worse. Just when you thought it couldn't get worse, two years ago, oh, I'm not good with dates, but I think two years ago, um, Golden Dawn and the Fascist Party got 15 seats in Parliament. So, I'll tell you a story, because I didn't really see it until I went to the islands. I, was, well, I went to the islands somewhere for a break, I was like, I need to get out of Athens, and I was walking down the main tourist strip of Athens, and this Ireland hosts more than 2,000 tourists a week from all over the world. Spain, France, Italy, America, anywhere you could think of. And I was walking down the main tourist strip and I was walking and I look up and I see the huge, like the biggest Nazi flag I've ever seen just hanging <laughs> in the centre of this tourist strip. And I was just like, that can't happen. I was like, how did that happen? I was like, ah! This can't happen. These tourists come here. Like this is like I, I feel embarrassed. I feel like you know, is this actually happening? But yes, it's happening because it was there, and I wasn't just hallucinating. It was there, and it was on the main strip of the of the, the town. So I better look at my notes now. I forgot what I was going to say. Um, so I told my friend Penelope about five years ago that if history repeats itself, I'm going to bomb it, and it does, and it did because what the Golden Door members do is it's that. They feed, clothe, medicate, and help out anyone who has a Greek passport. The people that they don't help are people that don't have Greek passports. What they do to them is brutally interrogate, bash, and have killed several people on the street if you do not have a Greek passport. Um, and it was really funny because I went to a christening on Saturday and bumped into a schoolmate of mine from Greece. And I was talking to him about this, and I was like, you should come to this talk, and I was talking to him about it, and I, was, I asked him a question, I was like, where do they get all the money? Like, where does all this money come from? Greece is going through a crisis, and yet this fascist, you know, group has all this money, they're clothing and feeding and giving medicine to everyone. And he told me that this Wednesday, Ariana, if you wanted to know, there are four containers leaving from here. Four containers leaving from here, from Australia, Melbourne, from here to there via them. And I freaked out. I was like, are you kidding? He's like, on an average, Ariana, um, sorry to tell you this, but out of 10 Greeks here, five of them are in support of this movement. 
and that freaked me out. That got me really scared. I was just like, how does this happen? How can we be sending food to these people from here? I understand it's for the Greek people and I, I would support that. I would support sending food and, and, and clothes for them. But these people are very violent and have done uh, hugely, they've, they've completely divided society into two you know, factors. Not only do we have those two factors, but we also have the communists and the socialists, and everyone is literally getting divided in half. Um, so I was like, right, fuck it. I need my answers. I want my answers, and I want them now. I want to know why this is happening. I was like, Penelope, you have to take me to Exarchia. I have to go. I have to see this. I have to get my answers. I want, I want answers, and I want them tonight. So she did take me. And, okay. It's not how I remembered it, but it's not, but it still is what it is. It still is a rebel's lair. It still is a place where people gather and talk politics and, and socialize. But what I saw was they, they're tired. You know, I thought to myself, how would that, how would that feel like? How would that feel like? I spent six days at Occupy Melbourne and nearly, and had several breakdowns. I couldn't imagine doing that for five years, okay? I couldn't even imagine doing that for five years. I did it for six days here, okay? These kids are tired, but you know what? They're still there. They'll still be there. They'll die for this because they really believe in this. And they're not just doing it for themselves. They're doing it for everyone. If you ask any Greek, this is a global movement. Everywhere in Greece it says this is a global movement. It does not say ever that this is just our movement. It is a global movement. They're doing it for everyone. The only protest I went to in Greece this summer, I only went to one, and it was for Syria. And it was with the communists, and I marched, and um, I'm not a communist, just saying. I'm just saying that I marched with them, so to put it out there. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> um, you. We had this conversation the other day. Um, but, um, yeah, I marched with them. So it's not just them. They think about everyone. They, they actually truly care about what is going on in the world. So I got too excited here. And I step outside Penelope's car, and there's this amazing um, graffiti artist going around um, tagging. And, it, and when I got out of the car, there were a bunch of um, anarchists sitting on the, the sidewalk. And above them, there was a big sign that says, um, That in Greek means, this is emotional torture. And I, I lost the plot. I was like, this would be a great photo. No, this, I can't take a photo of that. That's just too heartbreaking. I didn't know what to do. I was like, take me to the square. I want to go to the square. I just want to sit down and have a beer and a cigarette and just enjoy my time while I'm in Excited here because this is where I grew up. This is, this is my home. So I went to the square and my boyfriend turns around and says to me, gee, Ariana, this is not how you describe this place to me. And I was like, yeah, you're right. And I don't know, something clicked in me. <laughs> something clicked and I totally freaked out. I think I was this close to having a, a nervous breakdown. So I got up and I ran, and I ran to the social centre in Exarchia. And I got there and it was closed. And I didn't think to myself that it was closed because it was August and that's when everyone goes on holidays. I just thought it is closed and I want my answers. So I started banging on the door, banging the door, trying to get it open. And by this time, everyone had hurled around and I was screaming and I was banging. And I see my friend Penelope coming, running towards me, and she just grabs me and we, she puts me down, and I just start bawling my eyes out. Now, there's one thing I can assure you all, and this is, and this is it, that when a financial crisis does happen, when it does happen in, in your hometown, no matter how much you prepare, no matter how much you grow your own food, no matter how much you, you know, try, spiritually try, um, trying to build commun like community, there's one thing that I'm sure of, and that is it's very hard to be emotionally prepared for this stuff, okay, um, because it's real, and when, when you're in it, it's happening, and that, that, that's what I found. I found that for me personally, I knew what was happening, I read about it, I prepared myself, I went there, I, I, you know, but I didn't really consider extremely emotionally preparing myself for what, what was going to happen. I need to drink some water. Sorry guys, okay. That's done. Okay. Um, okay, so by this stage, my mornings ended looking like something like this. <laughs> so I was like, I have to get the fuck out of there. Or like this. Or like this. 
I'd wake up and be like, oh my god, I have to get out of here. And I was still supposed to be there because I wanted to celebrate my birthday with my friends who I hadn't seen in three years. So I decided, nah, I'm getting the fuck out of here because I can. I said that to myself because suicide in Greece has tripled. And I'm not going to lie, I'm going to be brave enough and, and stand... No, I'm not going to be brave enough. No, I am. I'm going to be brave enough and tell you that, that I thought about doing it while I was there several times, but I didn't. And that's why I'm here today to tell you my story. And... Oh. Okay, so... That's that. I got on a plane and the last thing I said to my dad is, if you vote for gold or not, I will never fucking speak to you again. And he turned around and said to me, don't take this personal. I had to sit with that for 17 hours on a fucking plane. Don't take this personal. Well, I get back and a week later, this happens. I don't know if you guys know about this. What is it? But this guy is, I'll hand it round. His name is Pablo Fisas. He got stabbed to death on the street by a Nazi party um, under the direct orders of its leaders. He is a, a Greek rapper. And I actually know this girl in the picture. It's his girlfriend. And um, no one did anything. My friend Penelope told me that there were cops right near where it happened and the girl was screaming for them to help and no one came to help him. So I called my dad up the same day I found this out and I turned around and I said to him, OK, Dad, should I still not take this personally because this is pretty fucking personal to me? This is really personal to me. Um, and he hung up the phone, of course. Anyway, so I got this letter from my friend Penelope, and I know my talk has been all gloom, but I just really wanted to, to give you what it truly is like to go and be in a city that is going through a crisis, okay? I'm not here to fairy floss it. I'm not here to, you know, give you the, the, the bright side of things. I'm here to give you the raw truth of what is actually going on, because I think people need, deserve and need to hear it. So I'm going to read this letter that my, my dearest best friend Penelope wrote to me. Um, it's a bit of a panic message, but it's because she sent it to me on the day that the guy got stabbed. So I'm just going to read it. Okay. <sighs> Penelope, my love. A Golden Door member murdered a Greek guy just because he was voting for the left wing. They've stopped killing Africans, Pakistans, gypsies, artists who are communists, and they have started with Greek region communists. Back in the 50s, are we? Fascism is on the rise. Spread the word. This is real. Greece is on the edge. Our government and mainstream media are in one way or another supporting this parade of hate. Spread the word because what's happening here will soon be happening in all of Europe and all of the world. Our governments have failed to serve the people. This system cannot hold any longer. The end... I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. We need deep change starting with the end of the current regime. Spread the word. We must bring the government down. Fascism is on the rise. And I get this and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so in saying all of this, there are so many positive things happening in Greece because they do stick together. I don't. <laughs> they do stick together. They do. They are, they, are, they are a nation that sticks together no matter what. They're very passionate and, they, and they're very communal. They're extremely communal. But I'm going to end my talk now and I'm going to end it with a quote from Margaret Mead, who is a renowned anthropologist. And she said that, never doubt that a small group of engaged citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you for coming.